Awesome. Thank you, Samantha, for your submission. Cool. Yeah, this first one, um, might have to review point slope a bit, but. Okay, cool. I'm getting a lot more responses now. Oh, it seems like a lot of people are getting really close. I don't know if I... Okay, I'm gonna give one more minute because we're gonna be hitting 10.10 soon. So one more minute. I have about eight responses right now. So um, just try your best in this next minute to answer. Um, if not, just submit what you have. And then I'm gonna call in some volunteers actually when we're going through the do now. The do now, um, the good thing is, well, it does deal with today's lesson more than anything you have learned in the past. Although I think with the tools you've learned in the past, I think we should be able to tackle the do now, but it is what we're dealing with today. So. Okay, cool. So it's 1010. Um, I'm going to give everyone now. Oh, shoot. Actually, okay, one more really quick thing. Um, so you guys actually did a really good job with completing your um, homework one packets. And I was comparing to the AB packet that I gave. I think the AB packet was significantly like not significantly i thought it was easier because the bc packet that i assigned had a difficult part with the limit definition of a derivative in my opinion that area was kind of confusing so um no worries if you were confused on that but i would like everyone to fill out this poll that i am messaging oh sorry that was not to everyone um i chatted the poll to everyone and just please fill out the poll of, like just like a really quick question about how you felt about the homework one packet. And then um, I didn't assign a packet over the weekend because I decided I wanted a bit of feedback from both my classes for what they thought. Okay, cool. Getting a, okay, this isn't too bad. I, my AB class, I got like a huge range of answers like, Literally, some people gave me a one out of 10, and then other people gave me a 10 out of 10. So that's kind of tough. But a lot of people, it seems like they're in this similar ish range. Okay. Okay, awesome. Thanks for that. Um, good news is this next homework packet probably won't be as long, but it might be harder because it's probably going to just be like straight up maybe two or three related rates problems. And we know those related rates problems can be really annoying. Um, I'm deciding what I want to do in terms of grading, in terms of cr like correctness again. Like generally, I want to be grading for correctness, but um, if you're turning in your packets on time with consistent effort, and I can tell you're really working through the problems, 
um, you're you're not going to get that bad of a grade. So just for future reference. Uh, okay. So next, I'm going to give everyone one minute to set up their notebooks. Usual stuff: name, date, topic. Say we're dealing with particle motion, uh, which sounds kind of confusing, but I'll just like right. It's just another application of derivatives. Like we applied derivatives to related rates. Now we're doing it with particle motion, except this is way easier than related rates. I can promise you that. Um, yeah. So you don't have to write application of derivatives, but just so, just so you're aware, like particle motion isn't some like foreign concept like we're dealing with like a different science altogether. Um, oh yeah, sorry, for the, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully everyone got that, but for the poll I sent out, um, the scale of one to 10 is one being easy, 10 being difficult. I hope that was clear. Probably should have written that down, but um, if that was not the case, if you answered like the opposite, please let me know because that would definitely change some answers. And yes, Daniel, we are gonna go over the do now. Um, I'm actually gonna move on to that right now. Oh, not that. Um, so that is the first task we're going to look at today. So our do now, basically it started by um, giving us, just helping us remember the equation for point slope the equation of a line. So as a quick refresher, when we write point slope equation of a line, y is just y, y1 is um, random point. So remember y1 and x1, these give us some random point on the line. They can be any point on the line, but it has to just be a point on the line, and then this equation works. And m is our slope. So, and then y and x, we just leave. Those are part of like the equations of the line. Y, like we have y equals eight x, you know, the y and x we leave. But in terms of everything else, x1 and y1 are, we remember, are just random points on the line and m is a slope. So hopefully that actually helps some of you guys um, to get the problem. Um, but I'm gonna ask for some people to chat their name right now for part A, determine the equation of the tangent line to the curve at x equals 4. So what did people do for the first step for this? Um, I'm going to give like five seconds for someone to volunteer, and if not, I'm just going to move on to cold calling, actually. Okay. Uh, Fatusi, could you come off of mute and um, tell us what your first step for this part was? Um, I took the derivative of x, I mean, of f of x to get the slope. Yep, that's exactly right. So again, um, I think when they people ask us to find the equation of a line, one of the most important things is finding the slope, right? So that would be my first instinct too. So again, we all know that the slope is just a derivative, right? So f prime of x, right? We're finding f prime of x. And Fartusi, could you tell us what you got for this, actually? Um, I got 4 over um, square root of x. Cool. So, yeah. So, if we just do power rule here, right? We bring the 1 half. We multiply that by 8, right? So, we can get 4x, and then we're subtracting 1 from the exponent, right? So, it's negative 1 half. Um, that's just power rule. You guys know the pattern, multiply the exponent by the coefficient up here, the coefficient, and then subtract one from the exponent. So one half turns into negative one half. And then this equals 
if it's a negative exponent, we can bring it down, so 4x to the 1 half. And then we know anything to the 1 half power is the square root, so we get 4 over square root of x. Cool. And then, um, let's see, Damani, now we have the equation for the derivative, but how do I actually find the slope at 4? Like, this is 4 over root x isn't the slope slope necessarily like how do I find like the slope is like 8 or like 20 like how do I find a slope I think you gotta plug in 4 for x awesome yep that's exactly right so I plug in 4 so we get 4 over root 4 right so we're gonna get 4 over 2 and that's equal to 2 so now we have one part of the um, equation we have m is equal to 2 we know our slope is equal to 2 now all we need to do is find y1 and x1. So we need to find basically a random point on this graph. Um, let's see, Mercy, um, could you come off mute and maybe try to suggest like how we could find a point on this graph for the for the tangent line, like a point on this line. Um. Well, they gave you the x of 4, right? So you could just, like, use that. Yeah, so that's that's a great point. So we know that the tangent line is tangent to the curve at x equals 4. So if it's tangent to the curve at x equals 4, we know that, so just to help someone visualize, let's say this is our graph, right? I don't know what a, x to the 1 half looks like. I don't really care right now. So um, at x equals 4, we're finding a tangent line, right? Well, what do we know? Well, we know that x equals four is on the is on the graph is on the tangent line, right? Because that's the point we were referencing. So we have x of one is equal to four, and then, well, we can just find the y for this point, right? Because that point is on the is on the tangent line. So how do I find this y? Well, I can just plug x equals 4 into this graph, into our original function, because that'll tell us the y at this point too, right? So I just plug in f of 4 is equal to 8, 4 to the 1 half, which is equal to 8 root 4, which is equal to 8 times 2, equal to 16. So that tells us at this point it's x of 1 is equal to 4, y of 1 is equal to 16. So we got our point. Our point is really 4, 16, right? Now if I use point-slope equation, I just plug it in. So y minus y1 is 16 is equal to n. Well, we got n as our slope. We already got 2. x minus x1 is 4. Um, so this is our equation. You're probably all more familiar with the y equals mx plus b form for writing a um, line. You can very easily convert this, those two. Um, I also prefer the y equals mx plus b form, but when you're like given a point and a slope, well, point, that's those two components. When you're given a point and a slope, this is by far the most effective method, like way to create a line. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully that helps with everyone. I'm going to give everyone maybe 10 to 15 seconds to copy that down. Again, we were able to find this point because we know that four is on the line, because that's the point that we're finding the tangent line, like the tangent line is referencing. And then that point also has a y value, right? So that point has a y value, which we can find just by plugging four in back into this function. So now we have a point in a line, a point in a slope, and then we use point slope form. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. And then part B, since we did part A, like finding the 
slope was just by plugging four into F prime. I'm just gonna run through part B really quick because I think everyone should understand this. We already have F prime of X is equal to four root over root X. Honestly, like you don't even have to simplify it this far if you understand. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah, it's four over square root of X. Um, so then F prime of 16 is equal to four over square root of 16 is equal to four over four is equal to one. So F prime of 16 is equal to one. And that also tells us that the slope, this isn't part of the question, but the slope of, the slope of F of X at X equals 16 is one. Um, just so everyone, um, understands like um, conceptually what we're dealing with when we look at derivatives again. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna give everyone like just five seconds to copy that part down. Okay, so moving on to the we do today, I'm actually gonna have um, you all comp complete this first part, read the problem and complete the first part on your own. Um, can I get Renique to come off of mute and just read the problem starting from Mia? And then, yeah, just read the problem, please. Renique, could you come off of mute and do that? Uh, wait, what are we supposed to be doing? So just um, read the problem for the we do. Oh, okay. Nia is in practice and receives a serve from Angie and bumps the ball straight up into the air. The motion of the ball in the air is represented by the graph of yt um, shown below. The position could also be expressed algebraically by y um, t equals negative one half t minus four squared plus eight. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, so uh, just to reiterate, so um, so Angie basically serves the ball, Mia bumps the ball straight in the air, and this is basically the motion of the ball. So this is position. So it says y over t feet. So this is like, you can think of it as like height. So that's how high the ball is. So at uh, what is this like four seconds the ball is um eight feet in the air at zero seconds this is probably right when angie so like once it reaches nia nia hasn't hit it yet so it's only it's not in the air yet uh, so you can think of it that way so i would like for everyone to do part one evaluate and interpret y prime of seven once you get your answer please share your name in the chat um, i'm going to give everyone maybe a minute, a minute and a half, two minutes for this problem. I would say um, for this problem, interpreting your answer is just as important, just as important as getting y prime of seven exactly right in terms of what I'm looking for. Yeah, I think you're very close with that answer. Um, 
so yeah, I would actually just move on to the second part of interpreting what your answer would mean. Like what does y prime of seven really mean in terms of the example that we gave of like Nia bumping the ball straight in the air? What does y prime of seven mean? Awesome, thank you, Aaron. I'm gonna give maybe another minute, maybe maybe a minute and a half. But again, if you have an answer, just any thoughts, please write your name in chat. Awesome, Kiana, yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you, Samantha. Awesome, Reese. Good job. Okay, 15 more seconds. Okay, cool. Um, Aaron, do you want to come off mute and just answer either what you actually got for your answer for y prime of seven, or you can interpret what it means. So just choose one of those. Um, I think y prime of seven is negative three. Cool, and how did you get to that answer? Um, so first, um, I, I put negative one half times t minus four squared plus eight. I put that in in quadratic form and mm -hmm. got okay. Yeah, I put that in quadratic form, and I okay. got. Sorry, go ahead. Half t squared plus four x minus eight. Okay. Cool. Uh, I'll put the plus eight on the other side. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that is definitely one way to do it. Um, this problem, and you can 100% get the right answer that way. I'm gonna show it the way I have written down, just because I feel like it's probably a bit easier. So you can definitely multiply this all out. Um, but I think an easier way is actually just to use chain rule. And chain rule, I feel like people have this perception of chain rule that it's always like. Kind of intimidating if you can avoid it maybe it's best to avoid it um, but in this case i i think it makes things easier so basically let's just apply power rule from the outside right so i bring the two down so i have negative one half on the outside that's our coefficient right so we multiply that by the exponent so we're going to get negative two over two right which is just negative one so let's just do negative one times t minus four and then we're subtracting one from the exponent so it's just to the one power right Cool, but again, let's not forget train rule. We have to multiply by the derivative of what's in this parentheses, right? But what's in this parentheses? It's t minus four. What's the derivative of t minus four? It's just one. So really, we're just multiplying this by one, and then we're finding, we found the derivative of this. Now we just have to find the derivative of eight, and we know that is zero, so. We have negative one times t minus four times one plus zero. Well, this is actually, it just all cancels out. So it's like negative one times t minus four, that's negative t plus four times one. Well, that doesn't matter, plus zero, that also doesn't matter. So this is our answer, negative t plus four. Uh, so it's a chain rule, but it's like extremely easy. Um, now we're finding y prime seven. So we're gonna get 
negative 7 plus 4 is equal to negative 3. So, um, Aram, you've definitely got to the right answer. So, good job with that. And then, Reese, could you come off mute and try to be as precise as possible? What does y prime of 7 really mean if you're trying to interpret it? Um, I think y um derivative of uh, y um y parentheses seven. I think that's um like the ball going down. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So um the ball is going down, and how do you know that? Let's say we didn't have this graph, so we I mean, couldn't look at this graph. How would you know that it's going down? It's like I mean, I just thought like, you know, a ball, if it goes in the air, it has to come down, so. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, that, that's right. Um, so, um, I think a good way to see that it's coming down is we're looking at the derivative, right? So we see the derivative at y prime of seven is negative. So that tells us already that the rate that the ball is moving is down. Um, Samantha, do you have like an interpretation of what y prime of seven really means? I think y prime of seven, it really just means, um, just means the slope at that point at y equals seven, at x equals seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Um, so at x equals seven, so that in this case, let's break that down. So um, x in this case, well, we'll call it t because they're using t. So at t equals 7, that's 7 seconds, right? So we can say at 7 seconds, or to be more precise, 7 seconds after Nia bumps the ball, I believe they're talking about volleyball here. So after she bumps the ball up, the ball position is decreasing. At, I'm, I'm kind of being overly wordy here, but at negative three feet per second. So when we say the ball's position is decreasing, what I'm really saying is that it's falling. So you can see this here at seven, right? We just found the derivative. That tells us the slope, like the slope of the tangent line, right? That's what we did over here. We know that this is negative three, the slope here of this line. Uh, it's a bad line, sorry. The slope is negative three. And what does that tell us? That means that seven seconds after Nia bumped the ball up, the ball's position is decreasing at a rate of three feet per second, because we are, this, neg this slope of negative three, we're told that it's in feet, it's in seconds. So we know that the rate is at negative three. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to give everyone 15 seconds or so to write that down. So I think that I, I think like that's what can be not confusing, but just that's the core principle of like derivatives and like when we find second derivatives. So this is a graph of position, right? This is this is we're told that at like basically at um, what is this eight seconds the ball hit the ground again because we know it's at zero, right? Um, at four seconds, the ball is as high in the air, right, as it ever was. 
that's cool. That's just position. But once we start looking at slopes, right, that's the derivative. Now we're looking at how fast is this ball falling? Because that's what the slope tells us. The slope is saying, well, in this case, the ball, we know that the ball is falling, right? Because the slope is going downwards. So that's what derivatives are helpful for. So at this like one and a half second mark, by finding the derivative, we can find how fast is this ball increasing. If we don't find the derivative, let's say we never look at slopes, we can find some useful information. We can find at one and a half seconds, it's maybe five feet in the air. It's five feet in the air, but we don't know how fast it's going or like what direction it's going. We, we can say it's five feet in the air, but without the derivative, we don't know if it's going down or up, if it's going whatever direction. Um, we don't, and we don't know how fast it's going. So um, that is actually a core point that we'll get to later. But, uh, okay, so I'm going to give everyone maybe one minute to solve this problem. Um, So hopefully you guys can have enough space to read that on the screen, but which of the following could represent the graph of y prime of t? So give, try to give two reasons or just some justification for your answer. So it's either gonna be graph A, B, or C. And again, this is y of t. So what is y prime of t? It's one of these three. Um, and once you get your, once you have your answer, just message that answer in chat. Awesome, Damani. Yep, that's exactly right. Thanks, Renique. Thanks, Mercy. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Christian. Awesome. I'm going to give like 20 more seconds or so. Okay, so I'm seeing a split between two answers. Um, wait for like maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, Derek, would you really come off mute and give your answer? Um, in your thought process. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So, um, I thought it was graph A. Gotcha. Um, and because, go for it. Sorry. Um, because the slope, I think, um, doesn't, um, y prime isn't that the slope? So, like, the slope slowly decreases as the um the ball goes in the air, I think. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good way to think about it. So it starts off, the slope starts off as very positive, right? You can see it starts off very positive, but over time, it's less positive, less positive, and then all of a sudden it starts decreasing. So we kind of have a sense that this slope, it go, it, the slope graph is gonna go down, right? It starts off very positive and it goes negative. But, um, Dick, what made you choose between, choose A between uh, graph A and graph C, because you'll notice that both of them are like going down. Um, I chose graph A because um, I feel like it made more sense because since at like, since at seven the um is gonna equal negative three, I felt like it should have been at a higher point. For like, like, I don't know how to explain it. Okay. 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 Fair enough. Um, 
Damani, could you come off mute and um, explain what you think, if you agree or disagree with that answer? Um, I disagree, and I said graph C because um, on the original graph of y, of y of t at 5, like at everything after x equals 4, it decreases. So if it's on if it's on um for prime, it should be negative and yeah. So it's negative. Yeah, graph I, C is negative after um after x equals four. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I think that's a that's a good way to think about it. So we see at on this original graph right at, at x or t equals four, right? This is kind of the point where it breaks, right, between positive slope and negative slope. So it goes from positive to negative here. Um, so we can kind of look for that same graph, which at four, you'll see it goes from above the x-axis to below the x-axis. So it goes from positive to negative. So that's definitely one way to think about it. Derek, you definitely have the right track. So at seven, right, we want to look for something that has a slope of negative three. Um, that's definitely true. I think if we actually want to be precise here, five, six, seven, there is a slope of negative three here because you notice it's one, two, three down. So it is a slope of negative three. So you're definitely on the right track and looking for that. Um, yeah, so we are gonna, the correct answer is graph C. Um, I think, Damani, you thought of it in a very intuitive way. Um, and there's definitely multiple ways to be able to like figure this answer out. Like Derek, if you did your method, you could also get to graph C. Um, for me, I like my instinctual process is like, okay, I'm going to find where the slope is zero because I know there's a zero on this graph. The slope is zero, right? At four. Okay. Where is there, is there a, is it at zero at four? No. Is that zero at four? No. Oh, at four, it's at zero. So that was my thought process. Um, but again, there's multiple ways to get to this answer. Um, actually, yeah, I'm going to give everyone like 40, 40 seconds or so. If like you want to copy down the answer choices, you don't really have to, but if you want to, I'm going to give everyone 40 seconds or so. Okay, so with our time remaining, which we don't have much of, I'm going to skip the rest of this problem because I think we should be able to do it. Um, we don't have much time, but I would like for as many people to try to attempt this problem as possible. So a particle moves along the x-axis so that any time in its position is I would actually like for people to attempt part B only. So during what intervals is the particle moving to the left? So if you recall from our earlier problem, position, position graph is just like F of T, right? That tells us position. F prime of T tells us our rate. So that's like speed slash velocity. And then when we look at F double prime of T, that's gonna be our acceleration. So when we're looking at when the particle is moving to the left, that's when velocity is negative. And we know what velocity is, so that should be a big hint. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna give everyone two to three more minutes to try to solve, figure this one out. We might run out of time for class, but. probably like one more minute left in class. I'm just gonna run through the problem. If you happen to, if you actually get an answer um, before then, that would be very impressive. And you can definitely message and chat for that. Um, but I don't expect anyone to do that necessarily.
yeah, I think this problem is kind of difficult. So, um, Well, okay, so I'm getting some volunteers. There's only two minutes left, but I'm going to call Aram. Would you be able to come off mute and um, tell me how you thought about this? Oh, my bad. Um, so first, um, I, found the, I found the derivative of the equation. All right, cool. So I'm just going to write down the derivative. So it should be um, 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. Cool. And then I found and the then, and then I found the second derivative. Okay, you found the second derivative. Okay, so second derivative would be um, finding acceleration, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that could be useful in some problems, but right now we're just looking for when the particle is moving to the left. So um, we would be only using the first derivative. Uh, how about Reese? I see Reese is raising his hand. How how would you proceed from the first derivative? What I did, I um I did um actually I divided um by three. I divided um each of them by three to make the um the quadratic equation like smaller. And then I um okay. after that I um what you wanna call it? I forgot what it's called, but then I found I think yeah I found the factors of it. Yep. So you factored it to t minus 3, t minus 1 is equal to 0. And then how about Samantha? Can you finish out this problem for us? Because Samantha, I believe you got the right answer. So I what I did was um I plugged in I plugged in like I plugged in um 0, 2, and 4 into the equation. And I knew mm -hmm. that um whichever number gave me like a negative number, that would be the interval and when it's moving um, left. So when I plugged in two, I got a negative number and I determined that that's when the um, particle, that's the interval when the particle is moving left. Okay, okay, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I'm gonna outline that problem. It is 50 right now, so if you need to go, that's totally fine. I'm gonna upload the lecture afterwards. Um, so this last problem, yeah or you can stay after class. I'm gonna run through this really quick. So it's kind of the same process that we are, um, so I see a question from Damani. I'm just gonna run through this problem really quick. So um, it's kind of the same process that we did for finding um, minimums and maximums. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So, well, my first instinct here when I'm looking at this is, all right, x prime of t, I have, our answer, so this is velocity. So I know this has to be negative. So I know this must be negative. But like, that's not really the easiest thing to solve for. Like, how do I, how do, I do this equation, right? Like, I know it has to be negative, but like, I can't really see, like, what does that mean? Like, how do I solve for t? So um, what we actually do here is we solve for zero, right? So then I know which intervals are gonna be at zero. So I know at t equals three, and t equals one, I'm gonna have a zero. So when I draw this number line out, I'm gonna have a three and one. So I know it's at zero here. So I know every other interval, it must either be positive or negative, positive or negative, positive or negative. I mean, we don't, we don't really have an undefined here. We could theoretically have undefined, but like looking at this equation, that's not really possible. So it's either positive or negative. So we can find our intervals then just by plugging in. So let's plug in zero into x prime of t. So x prime of zero is equal to, well, three times zero times negative three is negative three times zero times negative one is negative one is equal to, well, two negatives is a positive, so it's gonna be positive. Now let's plug in this interval right here, right? So this is not negative. 
uh, here, I'll make that more obvious. This is going to be positive. Plug in the second interval, let's plug in two. We're going to get three times two minus three is negative one. Two minus one is one. So we're going to get a negative number. Okay, cool. So now we know this interval is negative. Now let's plug in this final interval. Let's plug in four. Right, is equal to three times four minus three is one times four minus one is three. So that's three positive numbers, it's gonna be positive. So we basically come up with like our interval map or whatever, however you wanna think about it, right? We know these are the intervals. And we know that these three points, like at these two points are gonna be zero. So there's these three intervals. So our um, interval from one to three is negative. So that's how we know this particle is moving to the left. Um, so you'll notice it's the, kind of the same process we did for minimums and maximums. Um, again, if you need to leave the next class, I understand I'm running over, so uh, go for it. Uh, but just rambling on a bit, it's the same process for minimums and maximums. You'll notice that from plus, since it's going from positive to negative here, we also can use the same number line to tell us that there's a relative maximum. And here there's a relative minimum. So yeah, same type of thing. Um, yeah, that's not really re relevant for this problem, but um, just kind of an interesting way to think about the problem. So yeah, so thanks everyone for coming, etc. There's the, make sure you finish your exit ticket, class notes, turn in your class notes. Um, thanks everyone for doing the homework packet. I really appreciate you guys being so diligent with that. Uh, if you have any questions, I can be stay after class for a bit, but that's it, that's all we have for today. Mr. Wang, um, how did you, can you repeat when you said, how do you know one is the relative minimum? And we the relative maximum. Yeah, so um, I believe we covered that in uh, I think probably week one, or not like the second week, the second, the first complete week. Um, but since we have this, uh, wait, sorry, I got this a question from Reese. I, Reese, I would like you to complete the exit ticket. Or was there a point when I said you didn't have to complete the exit ticket? That's it. Okay, if it's possible for you to complete the exit ticket, I would like you to. I understand, um, like, sorry, okay. Yeah, I would, I would like it, I, I would like for you to do it if possible. Um, so, um, Nakaya, so just to answer your question, so we're going from a positive slope, right? So we know it's going positive, right, over here. Oh. And then, and then from one to three, it starts going negative. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's basically been our rule for how we know there's a relative maximum. Because you'll notice what that created is a maximum here. You notice how it's like a hill, right? We're at the mountaintop. And the okay. reason is we go, we went up and then now we're going down. So there's gonna be a maximum here. The opposite occurs over here, right? Because here we're going, right? We're going down, right? And then now we're going, and then plus up we're going up. Mm -hmm. So you notice there's like a valley. Oh, okay. Is that, does that make sense? So that's kind of our definition. Yeah. When it goes from positive to negative, we have a maximum. When it goes from negative to positive, we have a minimum. Right. Thank um, you. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Uh, have a good day.